January 1953, the eyes of the world were on the White House in Washington, D.C., where Harry S. Truman greeted his successor, Dwight D. Eisenhower, new president of the United States. After 20 years, a Republican returned to the White House. Mike, as he is familiarly known to fellow Americans, receiving his oath from the Chief Justice, the late Fred M. Vincent. A dramatic moment in the life of a soldier statesman, now the 35th President of the United States, Dwight D. Eisenhower and his Vice President, Richard Nixon. The names of two lawmakers, Taft and Hartley, were prominent in the news. And the death of Senator Robert Taft, Mr. Republican, co-author of the controversial labor bill, saddened the nation. Bob Taft had earned the respect of friend and foe alike. The president lost a wise guide and counselor. The death of Russia's premier, Joseph Stalin, was big news in 1953. Of two Stalin heirs, Malenkov won out over Beria, and the free world wondered what next from the Kremlin. Good news for the free world from West Germany, where Chancellor Adenauer won re-election, pledging Germany's continued support of NATO and the West, a resounding no to communism. Vatican City, Rome. Pope Pius XII presiding over the consistory, elevating new members to the College of Cardinals. Scenes of ancient religious pomp and ceremony. The Cardinals designate prostrating themselves before the altar to take the vows of high office. James Cardinal McIntyre of Los Angeles was one of the new princes of the church. Canada's first general election in four years brought five and one-half million eligible voters to the polls. Victory went to the liberal incumbents led by Prime Minister Saint Laurent. Coronation Fleet Review at Spithead for England's new Queen Elizabeth II, the greatest peacetime fleet in history, in a salute to Britain's newly crowned monarch. Even Russian ships were there. Diplomatic courtesy to the new Elizabeth, Britons hoped would bring back the glory of ancient Elizabethan times. year of disasters brought into sharp focus in Holland. The worst storms in 500 years lashed the North Sea. Flood tides and hurricane winds pounded the dikes. For centuries, Holland's bulwark against the sea. Despite heroic efforts to reinforce the dikes, the sea broke through, inundating one-sixth of the country. The land wrested from the sea centuries ago was lost to the raging torrent temporarily. During the nightmare of flood and terror, thousands lost their lives. But Holland faced disaster bravely, with help and sympathy from a queen. Disaster struck in Greece, too. Earthquakes jarred the fabled Ionian Isles. For days, the earth shook. Buildings, then entire towns, toppled. Trapped in the ruins, hundreds perished and thousands were injured. U.S. Navy units assisted in the rescue and relief of the stunned islanders who buried their dead and faced the cruel task of reconstruction. Disaster left scars that will take a long time to heal. The June rebellion of enslaved workers in East Berlin and elsewhere behind the Iron Curtain gave tangible proof to free men that all was not well with communism. Rioting Berliners turned on their commie masters, venting their pent-up spleen on red officials, and police were powerless to stop them. For days, anti-Reds rioted in East Berlin, and only the arrival of Russian tanks and troops saved the day for Moscow-trained stooges in power in East Germany. The temper of the enslaved peoples was graphically displayed. Men threw rocks at tanks. All was not well behind the Iron Curtain. In contrast to violence in East Berlin were scenes like these in West Berlin, where East Berliners lined up quietly to receive food much of it a gift of the United States. Food, a weapon in the Cold War, freedom's answer to hunger riots behind the Iron Curtain. The atom bomb posed the problems of preventing war and protecting citizens. Real houses with unreal occupants placed in the target area during tests could help man answer the question, is there any defense against the bomb? The 
fury of the unleashed atom strikes the house. The first atomic cannon. An atomic punch on the ground as well as in the air gave us a powerful new weapon of defense, another deterrent against aggression. Six of the new guns were shipped to Europe during the year to bolster the forces of freedom in the defense against communist imperialism. A kangaroo with wings, a B-36 bomber converted into a flying aircraft carrier. Long-range bombers could fly close to enemy targets, at least the atom bomb carrying jet fighters to dive down to the attack. Range of the bomber plus speed of the fighter effectively combined for swift retaliation in case of enemy attack on these United States. Mission completed, jet returns to mother plane, catching the hook suspended from the bomb bay. New weapons and new methods to keep us strong and free. Truce in Korea. Top story of 1953, the end of three years of bitter, costly conflict. The agreement was signed for the United Nations by General William Harrison, for the Reds by North Korea's Nam Il. Big problems remained to be solved at the conference table, but a big step forward had been taken, and the last shell was fired on the Korean front, at least for the time being. What lay ahead no man could prophesy, but for these GIs at least the war was over. They were alive and going home. Through Freedom Gate came the POWs, prisoners of the Reds for long months and years, many of them sick in body and mind. But they smiled now that freedom was here. Others were not so fortunate. Torture, neglect, death at the hands of the communists. Free men would not forget. General William Dean, the hero of Taejeon, back from three years of captivity. Arrogant to the last were the prisoners we released. In a defiant gesture, the die-hard Reds discarded their clothing provided by the UN allies. A grim lesson to the free world that the truce in Korea might well be but the prelude to aggression elsewhere in the world. 1953 brought hopes for peace, but in a world split by isms and by fears, Americans pondered the lessons of Korea and gave heed to their president. We have won an armistice on a single battleground, not peace in the world. We may not now relax our guard nor cease our quest. Yeah.